it's almost inevitable that Donald Trump is going to be prosecuted either in, 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 state, in a state court or a federal court. And I think that when that moment comes, that's going to be a watershed for Joe Biden. The fate of Richard Nixon in many ways defined Gerald Ford's presidency. And when he pardoned Richard Nixon, he ended up losing to Jimmy Carter in 1976. I think the stakes are, are just as great here for, for Joe Biden. That was our guest, Chris Whipple, the author of The Fight of His Life, Inside Joe Biden's White House, the first major book to take aim at the Biden presidency. I'm Mark Updegrove. And I'm Mark Lawrence, and this is With the Bark Off. Chris Whipple is an author and Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker. He appears frequently as a political analyst on MSNBC, CNN, and NPR, and his previous books include The Gatekeeper, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency, and The Spy Masters, How the CIA Directors Shape History and the Future. For the fight of his life, Chris spent two years talking with White House insiders, including Joe Biden himself, to provide a look at how the administration has faced enormous and in many cases unprecedented challenges. Some that came in the wake of the chaotic Trump presidency and others that have arisen since. Chris, welcome and thanks so much for joining us on With the Bark Off. Before we jump into the Biden presidency itself, I think it's important to talk about the transition, this extraordinary transition between the Trump and Biden White Houses. Uh, this certainly had to be the most challenging transition in in all of American history since Trump, of course, never conceded defeat and refused to cooperate with Biden or his team. I wonder if, if you could put that moment in historical perspective and perhaps talk about the strains that this situation placed on Joe Biden and his team. Well, as you say, I mean, it was the most fraught and contentious and, and dangerous transition since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an incredible story. Uh, you would think at this point that you've read everything that could possibly be, be told about that story. And yet I found to my amazement that a key part of the story hadn't been told. And so I, I devote a couple of chapters to it uh, in the fight of his life. And what happened essentially is that a small uh, group of, of Trump uh, officials in the White House uh, carried, carried out the transition as a sub rosa operation uh, under Trump's nose and without his knowledge. Uh, and uh, principally, uh, there was a deputy, uh, a deputy chief of staff named uh, Chris Liddell, a New Zealander who, who came to the U.S., uh, wound up running the Romney transition, ended up in the Trump White House, and uh, if not for this guy, Liddell, who uh, quietly kept the wheels of the transition turning during the, uh, during the last year of the, during the final days of the Trump presidency, uh, we might not have had a transfer of power. So it's, it's an amazing story, I think. And um, again, I was surprised that nobody else had told it. What is the greatest revelation about the transition that you, that you came upon in your, uh, the Chris Liddell thing, uh, Chris is amazing. Just knowing that there was somebody who was working surreptitiously to ensure uh, that there would be a, a smooth transition, despite Trump's orders not to cooperate. But what did you find that was most revelatory as you dug into this? You know, it's Mark. It's hard to single one thing out. It was just such an astonishing sequence of events. And uh, you know, I, I even have a uh, uh, one of the scenes I I like uh, is the private uh, Zoom session that Ron Klain had a month before the uh, inauguration with 19 of the 22 living White House Chiefs of Staff, uh, after which, uh, in the wee hours of the morning, Trump tweeted out, uh, be there, be wild. Uh, it's going to be wild, uh, as we all know. Uh, but one of the fascinating things was was Mark Meadows in, in the midst of all this, the the final chief of staff for Trump, who uh, 
who again, I, I described not so much a chief of staff as a kind of glad handing maitre d who would, <laughs> who would do anything Trump asked him to do. Uh, but he was a yes man to everyone. He, he wanted everybody to think he was doing their bidding. And astonishingly, at one point, the head of the Biden transition, Ted Kaufman, uh, sends a fax to the White House. Uh, by law, the chief of staff is required to sign it along with the incoming transition director. Kaufman was convinced there was no way in the world this would ever happen. Uh, he, he'd be shot, you know, if if uh, Trump learned about about it. And yet, suddenly, Ted Kaufman's fax machine clanked to life, and in in came this this document signed by Mark Meadows uh, authorizing the transition. Uh, Kaufman has it framed on his wall. He still can't believe it. Um, weird things like that were going on. Um, inexplicably, Meadows was giving this guy, Chris Liddell, his deputy, the green light to go ahead and do it. Just don't tell the boss. <laughs> I should point out to our listeners that Ted Kaufman is Joe Biden's neighbor in Delaware and, and worked for years and years with Joe Biden on Capitol Hill as at one point as his chief of staff. Very, very close to Joe Biden. And, and, and one of the, again, I was uh, really um, uh, lucky to, to, to have got access to most of Biden's inner circle. And nobody knows Biden better than Kaufman. And, and I got to know him pretty well. Chris, you talked about that Zoom call, that extraordinary Zoom call with 19 former chiefs of staff who are giving Ron Klain counsel as he attempts to take on the role for, for Joe Biden. That's got to be an amazing thing to have witnessed. You are an, an expert uh, on uh, on chiefs of staff, having written your book, The Gatekeepers. Talk about that conversation and what Ron Klain most took from it. So I heard about it uh, through my sources. And um, and this is a tradition that goes back to Rahm Emanuel when he came in as Barack Obama's first chief of staff. Uh, and uh, there, there was this there's there's this tradition of all the former chiefs coming together and giving uh, advice to the, the new kid on the block. Um, so they did it for Ron Klain. And it was in the middle of the covid uh, pandemic, of course. So it was all done virtually instead of in the chief of staff's office. But 19 of the 22 living chiefs were there, including two of Trump's chiefs, uh, Trump would not have been pleased if had he known this. Uh, and yet, uh, so Mark Meadows was not there and, and neither was Ryan's Priebus, but Kelly and John Kelly and, and Mick Mulvaney were on the call. There was a lot of really interesting advice given to Klain, but one of my favorite things, which you may appreciate, was the advice from LBJ's chief of staff, Jim Jones, <laughs> who was 28 years old, as you know, when he became White House chief of staff. Uh, LBJ didn't really have a chief, but that's a long story. Um, but Jones had Jones had the title, and he his advice to Ron Klain was to he was worried about Joe Biden's age. He Jones was 82 years old at the time of the call, and he said, "You know, um, I recognize him. I see myself in the president, uh, the incoming president. I'm an expert at stumbling going up the stairs." I see it with this guy and you've got to take care of him and make sure he's rested and that he's up to this job. Chris, tell us a little bit more about President Biden's relationship with Ron Klain or, or perhaps a wider array of characters who surround Biden in his White House. How are these individuals uh, shaping the, the Biden presidency and perhaps managing his appearances in public to cope with some of the kinds of problems that you're getting at? Well, it's 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 an extraordinary collection of, of talent, um, I have to say. And, and in a way, you think back to JFK's The Best and the Brightest, um, you know, it, it's it's a really competent, qualified group of people, um, and, and, may, and may, maybe Ron Klain most of all. I mean, I think every living White House chief of staff would tell you that no one has ever been better prepared than Ron Klain to be chief of staff. He worked for nine, count them, nine previous White House chiefs of staff. 
He knows the job cold. He knew it coming in. He knows Capitol Hill. He's politically savvy. And he has a very, very strong relationship with Biden, which, um, and as you guys know, um, that's the most important relationship of all. Um, they're kind of an, a, kind of like an old married couple. You know, they they don't see eye to eye on everything, but it clicks. And uh, one of when you ask Klain, ask ask Ron about it, he'll say, you know, I go in there. He he's a lawyer, and and he says I go in there, and I I I'll give five arguments for uh, prop for option A and five arguments for option B, and the president will say, well, what about C? What about B plus? Uh, <laughs> Biden tends to think in terms of his fingertips, his gut, uh, anecdotes, um, people he's, he's encountered. He has, and, and claims kind of the, the, the straight ahead, more lawyerly uh, one of the pair, but it, but it works. One of the many challenges, Chris, that, that Biden f has faced from the, the Trump hangover is his discomfort, in your words, with the Secret Service, many of whom are MAGA sympathizers. You write that he had a strained relationship with the Secret Service that would only get worse as he settled into the presidency. And that seems like a pretty big problem when you're the president of the United States. Talk about the state of the relationship between Joe Biden and his Secret Service detail. I was stunned to hear this. Uh, it's it's really a troubling um, thing, as far as I'm concerned, and it really um, it it really goes back to uh, if you go if you rewind to the transition. Uh, Joe Biden has always had a, a very good relationship with his Secret Service detail, and and he was close to the head of his detail during the transition. That officer, for whatever reason, was transferred out. Uh, Biden ended up with a much larger sec security detail as president, as presidents always do. Uh, and he quickly discovered that that some of some of that detail were MAGA sympathizers. Now, if you think about it, um, maybe that shouldn't be shocking because the Secret Service is, is full of um, white ex-cops uh, from the South, who tend to be deeply conservative. Mm. Uh, and so it sh maybe that shouldn't be surprising. But it, it bothered Biden um, on a couple of levels. I mean, he, you know, he felt that, for one thing, he always, he always considered himself a real friend of, of cops. You know, he'd always had traditionally uh, police unions were in his corner. They backed him for election. Um, he he's proud of everything he's done to uh, to increase police pensions uh, and other things. He's always felt comfortable with with cops. This just bothered him. Uh, Joe Biden felt that he should be able to persuade these guys to be in his corner. And a, a couple of major police unions backed Trump during the uh, hmm. 2020 election. So it bothered him on a couple of different levels. But to me, the most troubling level is the notion that uh, that Joe Biden can't necessarily trust his Secret Service detail to keep his secrets. Uh, that's the way he felt. Hmm. And I think that's a really troubling uh, situation. So what do you do about that, Chris? If that's the case and you're president of the United States, how do you fix that problem? Well, it's 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 a very good question. I mean, he he certainly has he certainly can find ways of 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 transferring agents out of his security detail, presumably. Um, why he hasn't done that um, in this case is is a is a very good question, and I'm not sure we know. Hmm. And it it could this is speculation, but he but it could well be that he doesn't want to doesn't want to be perceived as somebody who's being political himself that and, or trying to create some kind of Praetorian guard that's loyal to him. That's speculation on my part. But <clears throat> what we do know, we know more than enough about the troubles of the Secret Service in recent years. And uh, Trump, 
tried to politicize and to some extent succeeded in politicizing the Secret Service. Uh, all you need to know is that Tony Ornato, his, his most loyal uh, agent, was promoted to Deputy White House Chief of Staff, which was a bald political move uh, that tells you everything you need to know. So the Secret Service, I think, um, is in need of a shakeup. And um, maybe while the Republicans under Kevin McCarthy are uh, looking for uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, maybe the Democrats in the Senate should be looking at the uh, Secret Service. Chris, you've said that up to this point, the Biden story is, as you've put it, a tale of two presidencies, year one and year two. Uh, let's talk for a minute about year one, a period, as you see it, of challenges, of some setbacks. Um, one of the, surely one of the most striking setbacks of that first year was the collapse of Afghanistan. Um, talk a little bit about that episode and why it turned into such a debacle, at least from a public opinion standpoint, for Joe Biden. Sure. Well, it really is, I think, a tale of two presidencies, the, the first year and the second year. And in the first year, uh, you know, the, they came in facing the most daunting set of challenges since FDR's time, I think, only to be uh, confronted with all sorts of unexpected crises um, from inflation to supply supply chain problems, um, the Delta variant and everything else. Um, with Afghanistan, you know, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, has a favorite expression that he stole from Mike Tyson, which is uh, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> well, they got punched in the mouth uh, by Afghanistan. Uh, Trump bears plenty of blame uh, for leaving them, in effect, with Mission Impossible, I think, because he, by, by promising that the U.S. would get out in, uh, by May 1st, um, he, really, he really presented the Biden administration with, with an almost impossible situation. Um, I think the Afghan armed forces were not going to last much longer. Um, in in any event, but from the outside, obviously the the Afghanistan withdrawal was chaotic and shambolic and choose your adjective. But from the inside, it was even more fraught, and there was plenty of dissension and and well, there was certainly plenty of debate um, and disagreement, uh, particularly in the immediate aftermath of the withdrawal. Um, I don't know anybody else who's been able to sit down and 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 quiz uh, not only R Tony Blinken and Ron Klain, but also Mark Milley and CIA Director Bill Burns about this. But I was lucky enough to to do that for the book, and I lay I lay it all out um, or or try to. And <clears throat> what it came down to, uh, I mean, Tony Blinken said in no uncertain terms that. Everything we did in Afghanistan was based on an intelligent assessment that, that proved to be terribly wrong, which is that the Afghan government and armed forces would last for 18 months. Mm -hmm. I went over to CIA and talked to Bill Burns about that, spent an hour with him in his office up above Langley um, talking about this, and he had a very different um, version of, of, of that. I mean, he, he said that the CIA was clear eyed about the fragility of the Afghan government and armed forces. Uh, he said that if you, you know, their prediction depended on when you asked, but if you told, if you told the CIA that the U S would pull out two legs of the stool, namely, the U.S. military and the contractors who kept the Afghan armed forces up in the air, uh, the, the prediction was nothing like 18 months. It was, it, it was that would be real trouble almost immediately. Uh, Mark Milley gave me yet another assessment uh, saying that, uh, that he 
his recollection was that the intelligence predicted the Afghans uh, folding around Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of that behind the scenes, which I think is original reporting in my book. Um, at the end of the day, I think the, this was a whole of government failure. I mean, it was a failure at every level. And you can argue about the decision to withdraw, but it was the execution that failed. And uh, part of it was the U.S. military being completely clueless about the, uh, the ability of the Afghans to fight. Um, and so I think another, another major factor was that um, essentially we were trying to evacuate with only 700 troops on the ground. Um, you can't do that. And I mean, you, that never would have happened if they hadn't expected the government to last much longer than it did. Uh, clearly, things got better in year two last year as Biden found his rhythm in the White House. So what changed? Well, I think everything changed when Vladimir Putin launched the invasion of a democracy in the heart of Europe. I mean, this was the moment that Joe Biden was trained his whole life to confront. Uh, this is a guy who, who spent his whole career um, during the Cold War um, taking the measure of, uh, of the then Soviets and now Russians. And he was uniquely prepared for this, I think. Um, and, and I report a lot of the, the a lot of previously untold stories in the walk up to the in the walk up to the invasion. Uh, including a, a story of involving Tony Blinken uh, uh, eviscerating Sergei Lavrov at, at, a, uh, <clears throat> at a ministerial meeting and Kamala Harris meeting privately, secretly with, uh, with Volodymyr Zelensky and, and fearing that she might never see him alive again. Um, it, it's, um, it, it's a great story, um, a, a really important story, as we all know. That was the beginning, I think, of the, the change in, in Joe Biden's fortunes. But of course, he then was able to get on a roll with a number of, of bipartisan legislative victories, culminating in the, the, uh, the measure that really revived his presidency, um, and in, in my view, and that was the Inflation Reduction Act that Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin were able to hammer out that's been portrayed as um, Manchin and Schumer freelancing and coming to Biden's rescue. But as I report in, in my book, uh, this was aided, if not abetted, if not orchestrated by the team in the White House, including Ron Klain. They were in it every step of the way. And uh, so that's a great story as well. Chris, going back to year one, just for a minute, talk about yeah. why it was that the Biden presidency had so much difficulty with Build Back Better, with this ambitious agenda of domestic programs that, as you say, seemed to um, get somewhere in, in year two. But why was it such a struggle in year one? Yeah, the thing that hurt Biden uh, the, the most after Afghanistan during uh, the, the first year was uh, – was that long, ugly tug of war over the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill and and build back, build back better, as it was then known? Um, this was uh, Capitol Hill sausage making at its at its ugliest, and um, it it really was was a long. Uh, it it triggered, if or at least accelerated a, a long decline in Biden's approval rating. And and one of the problems was that the two the two bills were were linked, and uh, the progressives uh, didn't want bipartisan infrastructure without Build Back Better and all of the progressive measures that went along with it. Um, Biden, as a result, sent mixed signals, uh, conflicting signals, and I think he looked feckless and indecisive. For months, while well, that happened, three times he went to Capitol Hill, and the expectation was that he was going to finally put 
bipartisan infrastructure over the top. And, and he didn't. And uh, there's a great scene in the book, I think, when uh, Joe Biden gets on a plane in October to go to Rome and then to Glasgow, empty-handed, without his, the crown jewel of his legislative agenda, which was Build Back Better, with all of its uh, climate-friendly uh, provisions. And I went to see Ron Klain that Saturday, just as Biden took off and spent the afternoon with him. And it was really stunning to me because it was as though Ron Klain was, was resigned to it. You know, Biden had just said that his presidency, the fate of his presidency was linked to Congress passing these two bills and they hadn't. And Klain was telling me he, he put the, the odds at 50-50. Uh, he was basically telling me that um, you know, the Biden presidency was, was, uh, was in the balance, uh, it seemed to me. Um, so it's, it's remarkable how they, they were able to manage the turnaround. And as I say, um, I think it's a great story. I think the Biden presidency is a, is a political thriller. Um, <laughs> and of course, we don't know the, the ending to that thriller yet. But it, clearly, uh, uh, one of, Biden's greatest failings was uh, the the Afghanistan withdrawal, Chris. But what do you see as his greatest accomplishment? Well, <clears throat> I think um, you know there 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 are a number of defining tests of this presidency, and the first one would have to be the COVID, the once in a century pandemic, and his handling of that. <clears throat> um, a second is. Um, is, is Biden's rallying of NATO to uh, face down Vladimir Putin and defend Ukraine. Um, and there's a, there's a third uh, defining test that he's yet to pass, and that is uh, what happens to Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. Um, I think that it's almost inevitable that Donald Trump is going to be uh, prosecuted either in, in, in state in a state court or a federal court, um, and I think that <clears throat> when that moment comes, you know that's going to be a real uh, that's going to be a watershed for Joe Biden. You know, uh, the fate of Richard Nixon in many ways defined Gerald Ford's presidency, and when he pardoned Richard Nixon. He ended up losing to Jimmy Carter in 1976. I think the stakes are, are just as great here for, for Joe Biden. Um, but to answer your question of what, what his greatest achievement has been, um, I think you'd have to say it was rallying Ukraine, rallying mm. NATO to defend Ukraine uh, against Vladimir Putin. What is his view of Zelensky? You, you write in the book that it's there's, there's a little bit of ambivalence there. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Well, I think the Biden White House, no less than the rest of the world, was, was surprised by the way Zelensky rose to meet this moment. Um, this, uh, you know, again, everybody's used the, compared him to Churchill. I think that surprised Joe Biden. It certainly <laughs> surprised Kamala Harris, who... Uh, who, when she met privately with him at the Munich Security Conference right before the invasion, was uh, literally turned to a to an aide and said, "I wonder if we'll ever see him alive again." Um, so, I think that Zelensky surprised Biden, uh, just as we've all been surprised. But uh, he's also been somewhat exasperating because there's uh, Biden is trying to walk this geopolitical tightrope and avoid. Uh, getting into a nuclear confrontation with Russia and and Zelensky, no less than Churchill, is determined to drag the U.S. into this war, uh, or at least get all the weapon systems he can possibly get uh, and and defend Ukraine's airspace. So I think that that's been uh, a tricky uh, path for Biden, a tricky tightrope for Biden to walk. Um, but I'm sure that I, I think he he. He, he's been surprised by by Zelensky's courage, like we all have. 
And Chris, it seems to me keeping that balancing act going is going to be no small challenge. What do you think are the you know, the, the problems that worry Biden most in connection with Ukraine as we move forward into the second two years of his presidency? I think the thing that makes him lose sleep is um, the, the possibility that there still could be a use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, I talked to Bill Burns about this at length and the CIA director and Burns uh, and Biden see eye to eye on this, and it keeps them both up at night, I think. Burns <clears throat> talked to me about how he really feels that prevailing in Ukraine is almost existential for Vladimir Putin. Um, and when, at one point we were talking about it and he said, well, I wonder if uh, now that Putin has withdrawn to those provinces in the east, whether he would, whether he would negotiate with uh, with Zelensky, and I said, do you really think he would ever do that? Uh, mm-hmm. That he could find a, a, a modus vivendi, a way of a way of coexisting with Zelensky? And Burns said, no, I don't think he, I don't think he would. In other words, he would eventually come back to uh, trying to conquer Ukraine. Um, so I think. I think that um, nobody will talk about this, but I'm, there, you can be sure that there's a constant war gaming exercises going on, trying to anticipate what we would do in the event that that Putin did the unthinkable. Um, and I think that's for for Joe Biden. I think that's his biggest challenge. Chris, let me go back to Donald Trump for a second. While Joe Biden succeeded Donald Trump as president, he is still very much front and center in the Biden presidency. Um, and you write in the book, it, he, he knows his presidency will be, and this is a quote from you, judged on whether his attorney general ch- chose to prosecute the former U.S. president who tried to strangle democracy. I, I was interested in the book to, first of all, learn that Donald Trump left Joe Biden a very gracious note in the in the Oval Office after he left. We don't know the contents of that, but we do know that Trump took three days to write that two page handwritten letter. But but give us a sense of Biden's view of Donald Trump and his stance on whether Merrick Garland should prosecute Donald Trump and for the for the crimes he's committed. Well, first of all, it, it, that was an extraordinary scene of the discovering the tr- letter from Trump, as Joe Biden did on, on his first day and that afternoon of uh, when he walked into the Oval Office as president for the first time and uh, was told about this letter and he opened the drawer and he pulled it out and he read it as his, as his uh, most senior advisors looked on and, and looked up and said, that was gracious, shockingly. <laughs> Gracious. <laughs> you can only imagine what what he what Trump might have said. I I of course want to know did he did he in that letter uh, acknowledge that Biden was president? Did he? Mm. Uh, you know, which he had, has has not done to this day. But you um, wonder if he had done that, why Biden would not have revealed that to the American people as a means of showing the weakness of Trump's stance, is his argument that he won the election. I, I, I was interested in that too, Chris, and I wonder if how, how generous you can be without conceding defeat. Well, you know, the fact that the letter was, was that there was a letter left for Biden uh, has been publicly known. Um, I revealed in the book that, that he spent three days writing it, um, but none of us knows the, the contents of that letter. Hmm. Um, I think that one thing I can tell you is that something that shocked Joe Biden more than anything else probably during his presidency was the staying power of Trumpism. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I know that from from the people who know him well, that he thought this would pass. You know, it wasn't he it wasn't that he thought this was. um, uh, Gore Bush in 2000, uh, but he thought that he had a mandate. He'd won by seven million votes, um, and that th- this would fade. And it was shocking to him that it hasn't. So I I think 
I, I can tell you that. I can't get inside his head and tell you um, what he thinks Merrick Garland ought to do. But I think it's just an inescapable political fact, an inescapable reality that everybody talks about this being a by the book decision that will be based on the law and the facts alone by uh, a, a very neutral person like Merrick Garland. That's just not the truth. And at the end of the day, it's a it's a it's a decision with tremendous political significance. And um, so I, I, I think that Again, it's it's a real test of the Biden presidency. I'm not saying that Biden will pick up the phone and tell Merrick Garland that, hey, you, you've got to pull the trigger here. That's not the way it works. But that decision um, is going to be momentous. The 2022 midterm elections, of course, have been widely understood as at least a partial tentative indication that Trumpism may be on the decline. Do you think that President Biden drew at least some confidence from the outcome of the elections uh, that would affect his calculations with respect to how he should handle Donald Trump going forward or, or frankly, any number of other issues? Yeah, I can't I can't say how I think it might affect um, whether or not Merrick Garland uh, decides to prosecute Trump. But I think that the there's no question about the fact that the midterm elections uh, were a very big deal um, at the White House. Uh, they really feel they have the wind at their backs. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's interesting. One of the stories I tell is that in the, in the afterward to the book, um, we did a, I did a hasty afterward right after the midterm elections. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, but one of the stories I tell is how uh, Biden during the midterms wanted to go everywhere and talk about everything. He wanted to talk about his his complete legislative record from day one to up to the midterms. And Ron Klain and the political staff sat him down uh, and they said, Mr. President, uh, you're going to go to the places where you are going to do the most good. Number one and number two you're going to be talking about reproductive rights and MAGA. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Biden, to his credit, took that advice, and the rest is history. One of the most uh, consequential decisions that Joe Biden has made was naming Kamala Harris as his running mate. And you write that she has chosen to model Biden's vice presidency under Barack Obama, but you quote, Biden is telling a close friend that he sees her as a work in progress. How would you characterize Kamala Harris in her current role? Well, the, the relationship between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is complicated and fascinating to me. You know, by all accounts, according to the people who were in, the, in these meetings and who, who know them both well, uh, early on, Biden had a real there was a real warmth that he had that he displayed toward her. There was a real bond there. He appreciated that she brought a completely different uh, set of views and world ex and experience to, to the job. He, when a meeting started and she wasn't there, he would look around and say, where's Kamala? Uh, they were thrown together in the beginning of the presidency by COVID. Uh, Neither was traveling much, and they spent a lot of time together. But things got more complicated uh, when the troubles began for, for Kamala Harris, and particularly with the, the assignment uh, to take, take on the Northern Triangle, uh, the root causes of immigration uh, to the southern border. Her trip to Guatemala, which was <clears throat> widely panned. Everybody's probably forgotten about it by now, but it was... You know, she fumbled that question from NBC's Lester Holt about mm. going to the border and, and was, was widely criticized. Uh, this took a toll on, uh, on the vice president's office, and a number of her allies uh, started saying publicly that she'd been given this impossible portfolio. It was, it was, it was too difficult. <clears throat> um, 
she had the Northern Triangle and she had voting rights. And voting rights, as we all know, was a very, very heavy lift uh, indeed. So word got back to Joe Biden that um, not only were these allies complaining, but the, the second gentleman, uh, Doug Emmerhoff, was complaining um, to a, a lot of people. And this just annoyed the president. Uh, you know, he hadn't asked her to do anything he hadn't done as vice president. He was in charge of the Northern Triangle um, under Obama. Um, but that was when he turned to a friend and said, you know, that's, she's a work in progress. Um, now, having said that, I think, um, you know, their relationship uh, may have improved. Um, this was early in the first year. I know that he has has given her a number of uh, important national security assignments. Uh, he sent her to the Munich Security Conference on the eve of the invasion. She's, by all accounts, she's been hitting her stride in the in, in na on national security issues. Um, but it's a complicated relationship. Chris, the big question, of course, that looms out there these days with respect to Joe Biden is: Will he or won't he? Will he or won't he run? for a second term. What's your answer to that question? I think almost without a doubt. Um, <clears throat> Andy Card once told me something that, um, that rang true, and, and that is, um, if anybody tells you they're leaving the White House voluntarily, they're probably lying to you. <laughs> now, <laughs> you guys, uh, of all people, should appreciate this because when was the last time a president walked away voluntarily LBJ. Mm -hmm. um, th there is something about being in that office and that makes mm -hmm. presidents um, reluctant to walk away. And and so I don't I don't think there's any doubt about it. You know, Joe Biden has spent his entire career every four years. He has either thought about running for president or run for president <laughs> uh, since he's been able to. And I think he's got unfinished business. Chris, just going back to the uh, 2022 midterms for a moment, what do you think are – what is what is Joe Biden's sense of his major assets when he's out on the campaign trail, you know, running for reelection that um, became clear perhaps to all of us as a result of what happened recently in the midterms? Well, he, he's always had this, this, this connection with – the American people, I think he's, you know, he's, he, he's certainly, we've, we've all heard the cliche Scranton Joe. I mean, this is somebody who, who knows how to speak to people about difficult issues in ways they can understand. Um, I think that's, that's been his superpower. Mm -hmm. um, but the other is that Joe Biden has been constantly underestimated at every turn uh, mm. throughout his his career, and I think that um, we're seeing an example of that as he as he's hit the two year mark. In an interview with Biden for the book, he told you, I'm quoting Joe Biden here: "Our democracy isn't perfect; it never has been, but every generation has opened its doors a little wider." American history tells us that from some of our darkest moments, we've made some of our greatest progress. It's the test of our time to do that again now. Do you think Biden has delivered on that promise? You know, let me just say about my interview with, with Joe Biden that, that I thought he was really remarkably revealing. And um, this, is, um, this is someone who talks constantly about Charlottesville. Uh, it all goes back to Charlottesville. Uh, in his mind, that was a – presidents had said terrible things before, but they'd never gone that far. This was, uh, as, as Mike Donilon, his uh, wordsmith, put it to me, this was a door he felt he had to close. Um, and so <clears throat> he hasn't – in a way, that's an unfinished task, isn't it? I mean, he hasn't closed that door entirely. Donald Trump is running for president. Uh, he is more powerful, uh, 
I think also underestimated, more powerful than people uh, people like to think. Uh, he, yes, he's had a, a rough couple of months or whatever it's been since he announced his reelection, but um, no one should underestimate Donald Trump either, uh, mm -hmm. and and the and the iron grip he has on on that Republican base and his willingness to do whatever he has to do to take down anyone who tries to take away the mantle. You know, I, so I think um, he's still dangerous. I think Biden believes he's dangerous. Um, but I'm not sure that's, the, that's not the only reason uh, that Joe Biden is running. Um, but it's, it's one reason. Uh, and he's beaten him before. Chris, I think it's obviously unfair to ask you about Joe Biden's legacy as president, given that he's only halfway through his first term. But still, how do you think in 20 or 50 years we'll be talking and thinking about the presidency of Joseph Biden? You know, John Podesta used to, uh, <clears throat> whenever, whenever anybody brought up Bill Clinton's legacy, he would throw them out of his office. He didn't want to. He, he didn't want to hear anybody talking about legacies. Too soon. He would. He would be saying, um, <clears throat> "It may be too soon to say what Joe Biden's legacy is." But I think, um, I think that ultimately, Joe Biden will be remembered uh, for the way he stood up to a dictator who invaded a democracy in the heart of Europe and. Uh, put us all on the brink of, uh, of nuclear war. Um, I, th there's no greater test that I, that I can think of than that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I said at the beginning that when he came into office, he faced the most daunting set of challenges since FDR. Um, well, arguably, this is as, as dangerous um, a, a situation since, since FDR. Um, so I think he'll ultimately be judged by that. Obviously, the, the pandemic um, and, um, and Trump, um, but I think ultimately Ukraine will be, will be his legacy. Chris, what do you expect from the Biden presidency for the next two years until the election of, of 2024? Well, I think that now comes the hard part, um, as if it wasn't pretty hard up to now. He, he has to do a, a number of things. He has to try to avoid a recession. He's got to try to bring uh, inflation under control. He's got to implement all the legislation that was passed during the first two years because none of it matters uh, really until the rubber meets the road. Uh, again, he has to confront uh, MAGA, uh, the, the, the continuing, the fact that, you know, it may or may not be in its death throes. Um, he's got to keep NATO um, united uh, against, uh, against Putin and in defense of Ukraine, and that's, that's no small task. Um, and I think he feels that he's not done uh, when it comes to his, some of the progressive elements of his of his legislative agenda, some of the things that were thrown under the bus uh, with Build Back Better. I think he'd still like to achieve some of those things. And, and, I, don't, and, and I think he's a guy who, who believes it when he says that he thinks he can get bipartisan stuff done. Uh, and um, he, he, he succeeded in doing quite a bit in, in the second year. So uh, he's got a full plate and um, it's, but, but the challenges are enormous, uh, I think. So it's going to be, it, 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 the next two years are also going to be a fascinating time. Well, Chris, we look forward to having you back for what may be part two. <laughs> yes. Great, I look forward to it. Well, Chris, thank you so much for helping us to think through the first couple of years of the Biden presidency. Indeed, we'll see where it goes from here. Congratulations on publication of The Fight of His Life Inside Joe Biden's White House. Thank you so much for making time to be with us. Honored to be with you guys. Thanks for having me.
My thanks to our sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare, and as always, to you for joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Mark Updegrove. See you next time.